And nice to see Tim again, who uh, I remember. Well, I don't remember actually, because I passed out on your sofa at a party. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've, uh, I've been with the Environment Agency, this is my 25th year. So for me, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a vocation, not a job. Uh, and I live in Otley, so uh, the River Wharf is, uh, is yeah, part of that vocation, I guess. And uh, yeah, lovely to hear that, Amy. It's kind of uh, one of the things that I, I reflect on is um, it, it's fantastic that this is a like a sellout gig uh, because it, it shows that um, all of you are kind of have an interest in what the future of rivers is going to be. Um, and I always I always keep in mind that bit that in terms of problem, some of the problems that we've got in Wharf down there across rivers in Yorkshire generally, uh, in terms of when they were used for hydropower, so we've got paper mills in, in, in Otley, I think it's one there. When they were used for hydropower or, uh, or, or cheap ways of getting rid of waste, uh, it was human beings that did that. And I always, I always hang on to the fact that it's, it, it can be human beings that get us out of that as well uh, and take us, take us forward. So I'm going to talk about these. Okay, I'm going to talk about defining uh, river quality. So Rick's touched on, uh, on uh, bacteria which is used uh, in the Bailey Wars Directive. Uh, I think Mark mentioned something around good ecological status, so I'm just going to unpick that a bit for um, uh, why we do that. Um, what, what the environment agency is doing around that current state in terms of how it's going to uh, get us to 75% good ecological status by 2027. That's one of the current targets. Uh, and what could be better in some of the things that the, uh, that the, that the future might bring. So when the slide pops up with DEFRA's 25-year strategy uh, for the environment, uh, it was written by Michael Gove and has uh, Theresa May uh, fronting the frontispiece. We're already two prime ministers and two environment secretaries uh, into that uh, into that 25-year plan. So you know where you are. Rick showed you the slide already, so that saved me at least a minute. So what a framework for it. So this, this is around water bodies. Uh, so what, what, what we did in the, in the thousands, in the noughties, uh, is we divided all the rivers up into water bodies um, of similar geographic type, so that we could have uh, put one uh, representative sampling point, and Rick's point about local monitoring for local issues, very good, it's very hard to choose a, a representative site, uh, sampling point from a river when that water body could be up to forty months as long, for example, but that's what we did. Uh, in, in the wharf and the lower rooms, there are 53 water bodies, so that gives you an idea of... Uh, in Germany, I think they managed to get uh, water bodies on the Rhine down to about two. But the Water Framework Directive was something that the UK were really, really keen on. Uh, and we threw ourselves into it with gusto in the, in the, uh, the turn of the last century, and we really led on it. So we really threw the kitchen sink at it. Uh, and we've got 53 water bodies uh, in, in, in wharf area. And each of the things that we do in terms of determining uh, good ecological status around the elements that are in there, and we choose those elements for different reasons. So we look at invertebrates uh, as a way of um, understanding the organic load. Before the Water Framework Directive, we used to do this thing called uh, the General Quality Assessment, where every five years we used to dash out and sample every river uh, and just look at invertebrates, because at the time organic load was one of the key problems. But, Water Framework Directive thinking taught us that the stuff that Rick's touched on around um, uh, algae and plants meant that we were missing a trip with phosphorus by just looking at invertebrates. So we included that in the directive. We look at general chemistry and we look at fish. We also look at geomorphology, so the shape and the size of, uh, of, of rivers and how they've been modified by us. Um, and all those things uh, combined together. Um, the reason that Dickie Bird is there sticking his finger at it uh, is it's done on a one out, all out principle. So the, the reason for the ecological status of England uh, on average is 16 is because you can, uh, that status is only given uh, based on the worst performing element. Rightly or wrongly, that, that's how it works. So you go from high to good, and what, you, what you're basically doing is uh, you're trying to compare each of those elements against what the reference state would be if there wasn't any pressure. That's, that's all we're doing. So in a perfect world, a perfect river with uh, with no barriers to fish movement, great clean gravels, uh, the fish would, would achieve high status. Uh, and if the chemistry was right and the invertebrates agreed with it, then you would get a high status, uh, high ecological status river. 
So, the ambition under the, uh, uh, under the strategy for the environment um, is around uh, clean and plentiful water. So what we realised, this is sad, when you've been around long enough you can see the naive sort of it. But uh, when, we, when we started the first regulation cycle back in about 2005, so we had three cycles, each lasting six years. For those of you that commented on the last regulation management plan, I thank you for your comments. Uh, like going forward in terms of uh, uh, how, we, how we continue to uh, manage all the rivers in Yorkshire. Uh, but, but when that first cycle went in, we, we, we thought that by 2027, 75% of the rivers would be at good ecological status. Uh, what Michael Gove did for us was uh, said, well, if you can get it there by 2027, great, uh, but uh, if you can't, uh, then make sure you do it by the end of the 25-year strategy, which is actually, I think, 2043 or 2040. But basically, the goalposts are, are, are moving. So this is, this is Yorkshire in terms of good ecological status. Uh, so the yellow stuff is moderate. Okay, some deviation. Uh, the red stuff is bad. So you can, uh, if you know where the, um, if you know where the wharf and lower roofs is on that map, you see that blob of blob of red in the middle of it. That's Cockbeck and uh, and the Foss. Johnny's laughing in those one. Uh, and that's basically due to fish, uh, uh, fish barriers uh, and sedimentation uh, in those two 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 banks that are in and around the Tadcaster area. As you go further up into the Dales, uh, up into the Yorkshire Dales National Park, you can see there's a bit more green there. Uh, not a great deal, but that is good ecological status that we're, we're trying to aim for. So uh, by 2027, we're hoping that all that map is going to be green. And we ain't got a lot of time. Uh, so if you look at that uh, pie chart, the Wharfdale WFD classification, that gives you, of those 53 water bodies, uh, you can see that there's quite a few of them uh, at, at moderate. There's what, 19% are good, which is better than the national average, but still not great. But one of the things I want you to take away is, if you look at each of the individual elements, so if you take out the one-out, all-out rule, uh, most of the elements uh, are at high status. So this is the bit that the Environment Agency struggles to get the message across. That, for example, if you have uh, and on my opening slide, that was Tadcaster, by the way. Between the two bridges of Tadcaster, you've got an absolutely mo uh, stonking great weir. Uh, and that, that stops fish, fish migration, and uh, because the fish can't migrate and travel up and down the river, that means that everything upstream of that weir and the subsequent weirs that are a problem, at adding them at Burley and Wharftail, uh, there was a problem at Hotley, but that's been fixed by a fish pass. Fixed dish, Johnny might pick up on that, uh, because we have a slightly different view on fish passes. Um, so basically everything upstream of that obstacle then, then puts the rest of the river into moderate, moderate class, <coughs> even though the inversion might be telling you it's okay. So it, it's, it's complicated is what I'm saying. Uh, if you want to find this data, I would urge you to uh, use a search engine and go for Catchment Data Explorer. It's all there. Look for your local river or the area that you're interested in, and you can see the pressures, you can see uh, what the current classification is on most of the elements. Uh, and it'll give you some, uh, give you some in information. So, totally recognise uh, the, the current zeitgeist for um, sewage in rivers and storm overflows, uh, but there are other reasons why Wharfdale is not achieving good <coughs> ecological status. And in terms of problems, uh, so what we do is we do this thing called uh, reasons for not achieving good. So when we've um, when we've looked at um, uh, when we looked at where we where we've got deviations from from good status. We've then gone out into the catchment and, and made an assessment of what, what those pressures might be. So you can see, if you just take the bar charts without the colours, two main things, water company and agriculture. So I'm not really saying anything that Rick's not said. Those are the, those are the, those are the two things. If you look at the water industry one, most of that is pink. So that's water industry's effect on, uh, on, the, on the physical interference with rivers. And that's largely re representing Grimworth Reservoir, regulates the flow uh, into Dibble. So all those water bodies that are associated with that have an impact from that reservoir being there. And, and that's why uh, some of those aren't achieving good status. Again, we picked up a bit around um, mining in Wharfdale. It's not quite as bad as Swaledale, uh, but uh, we still do get a, a, a lead zinc uh, impact uh, in the River Wharf. In fact, 
Uh, somebody once told me not to put my name down for an allotment on the, in, in Otley because you still get zinc in the soil there. Uh, I didn't know that was true, but I gave up because the, uh, the waiting list was so long for the allotments anyway. Okay, so what do we, what do, we do about it? So, uh, regulation. So what I'm, going to, what I'm going to talk about, some of the levers that we as the Environment Agency can pull to, uh, uh, to, to affect change. Uh, so the first one is, um, is where we issue permits. So we issue permits for a whole range of reasons. I, I just thought, oh, I'll go onto our, I'll go onto our permitting database and have a look at what's in and around Brassington. So that uh, up there represents how many, how many permits there are in this area. So those, uh, those pink triangles are uh, what we call groundwater permits. So if you want to pour something on the ground, it might get, to the, might get through the soil uh, and into the groundwater. Somebody owns a permit for doing that there. You can see Grimworth Reservoir and the, uh, and the red diamond. So that's an impoundment license. Uh, and what our permit will say there is that they need to release a certain amount of water uh, to make the river flow and to protect the ecological uh, process. Unless, of course, there's a drought on. Guess what? There's a drought on. Uh, and so you'll be seeing a lot of stuff in the media around drought orders and, uh, and regulation as uh, we try to work with the auction water to throttle back the amount of water that gets released from reservoirs so your taps don't run dry. But that does have a short term ecological impact. Point by that. And then the little green ones are discharge concerns. Those are, so those are either discharges out of private septic tanks or they're Yorkshire water uh, discharges. So what I'm saying is there's, this is just a snapshot from this local area. I think we've got about 5,000 discharge permits overall in Yorkshire. Uh, and what that does is it gives the Environment Agency a regular income because people pay for them every year. Uh, and it gives us the opportunity to go out and police them and look for compliance issues. Uh, where we don't find compliance issues, then we've got a num number of things that we can do about that. Uh, advice and guidance, warning letter, right through to prosecution. Uh, you would have seen those things when they land in the newspapers, Southern Water, 90 million quid, that kind of stuff. So let's touch on that uh, in terms of water industry and our role with, uh, with our local water company, which is um, Yorkshire Water. So under the Water Industry National Environment Programme, this, this is how we deal with this. Uh, so there's 14 water and sewage companies. Um, since privatisation in, in 1990, 25 billion has been invested into the environment. Is that enough? I don't, I don't think so, because we're still at 16% of the ecological status, but that's what it has been. Uh, put that into the context of COVID cost us 200 billion. Um, the he heating uh, and cost of living crisis is going to cost us 120 billion. So in my heart of hearts, I think sometimes we could find these things. Uh, if, we've, uh, if we've got the will to do it. But uh, so far, uh, we haven't had a, a, a will that's bigger than uh, 25 billion up until now. So in the next five years, uh, five billion is gonna be invested nationally, and one billion of that is gonna be in, in the auction. So some of the things that we've talked about already, um, in terms of the hotspots around the Ilkley and, and the sewage works there. So we're going to this thing called Price Review 24 at the moment, we've got until March uh, 2023 to agree with Yorkshire Water where the investment's going to go. And uh, uh, some of it's going to go into Ilkley uh, and, uh, because, of, because of the bathing water, causing that to be a driver. One of the things you will have done, you probably have clocked already, but I'll, I'll just make it clear. Under that good ecological status, bacteria is not part of it. We only monitor uh, bacteria uh, where there's a bathing water, uh, which is why uh, yeah, we, we, we encouraged um, the Ilkley Group to go for a, a bathing water status because it would give us the ability to get involved in the monitoring and start understanding the problem. Uh, in the same way as Linda Richards, who's the councillor in Weatherby, hopefully we'll be putting in um, uh, bathing water application for Weatherby and Boston Spa later this year. Uh, and we, uh, you know, we're working with Yorkshire Water, they, they plot that and they put that on their list of things to think about. So we do five years of investigation and, uh, and then once, once we found out what the solutions are as part of that investigation, spend another five years uh, putting that in place. Sounds great, doesn't it? What's wrong with that? It takes flipping ages. That's, that's the problem with that. So other than, uh, other than working directly with the water company and, and, and regulate, uh, as a regulator, we also have the ability to work uh, in partnership with others uh, through our, what we call our environment programme. So we pick up bits of money uh, from the, these are the various sources, but this this is for um, uh, th this year basically. Uh, we've got um, about two two million pounds 
with our own contributions and partner contributions to do some active stuff. So not, not just regulation, this is around trying to proactively improve things, take things to good ecological status. Uh, what have the Environment Programme done already? Well, we have worked on the uh, Upper Wharf Restoration uh, Project, uh, put a fish pass in at Boston Spa, uh, we've done a Yorkshire Agriculture Best Practice Project, uh, and we've done a bit of peatland restoration. Uh, interestingly, and I'll, I will kind of expand this, but one of the things that the Environment Agency needs to get better at is uh, we tend to work in silos, both in terms of funding and function. There's a really great example in, in, in Wharfdale of um, where, where, where we could uh, work more holistically, uh, and that's around, uh, uh, so we, we funded a project with Bradford um, to uh, look at peak and restoration on the Friends of Ilkley Moor, which involved uh, leaky dams, holding back water, keeping water on the, on the hillside, on Backstone Beck, and as part of that, discovered that Backstone Beck uh, goes directly into the combined sewer system. At some point in the past, somebody has decided to culvert it and stick it into the sewer rather than the natural course. Therefore, you've got a direct uh, link between rainfall and what's going into the combined sewer. When the combined sewer is overwhelmed, that's why storm, storm overflows fire. Great. Why were we looking at it? Because we were working with Bradford to try and alleviate surface water flooding. Uh, so there, you've got a nice little link that puts together conservation, flood, flood reduction, uh, and a reduction in storm sewer overflows. Uh, and if we could start to do that on a much bigger scale across Yorkshire, that would be a great, that would be a great integrated solution. So these are uh, some of the projects that we've been uh, on with this year. Um, Again, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll skip through this because this, this is the sort of thing that these these projects are on. So this is rivers in Elmer. So again, Rick, Rick and I didn't make this up, or we didn't collaborate beforehand. But Rick's cows standing in the river are a real problem, not only from from an introduction of uh, a, a fecal uh, indicator organisms, but also just the, the, the sediment and, and, the, and, the, and the runoff. So we spend uh, spend some of that money on, on projects like <coughs> spent fencing off the rivers. Uh, and putting in buffer strips so you get a vegetational margin that will soak up some of the uh, some of the nutrients and it will also hold the banks together and stop bank collapse and it will also um, hold back uh, animals and, and stirring things up. I don't know what it is about cows, if you've ever watched cows, as soon as their hooves touch the water, they let go. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a fact of life. <laughs> Future opportunities. <laughs> So this is around, uh, so this is the bit I was trying to uh, start the conversation on in terms of our silo thinking. So back in the day, uh, money came in uh, from our regional, uh, from our regional departments into flood risk and they built flood, flood risk structures. And that usually meant pouring, car, uh, pouring concrete, making flood walls and protecting 300,000 homes. We're incredibly proud of the fact that in the last six year plan for flood risk management, we have protected 300,000 more properties than were protected at the start of that plan, which is great. But let's think about where those, where those problems are. Historic York, there's a flood risk scheme going on there at the moment. One of the issues there is that uh, under planning law, uh, planning, uh, planning restrictions, it's a historic site. Uh, you ask the people who live in York, most of them will say, actually, you don't want a great big concrete wall separating us from the river. Uh, we want you to come up with uh, something a bit different. And that's where you start to think about that's when you start to think about how, how can we do this uh, more widely. So the solutions are things like natural flood management, NFM. So we've built the walls in York that's high as we can build them. We're starting to look at where we can do uh, additional flood storage uh, upstream of that in the dales. Um, and that could link in with local nature recovery strategies. So if you're, going to build, uh, if you're going to build things that are going to store water up in the dales, why not build them so that they have multiple benefits in terms of trapping carbon and creating habitats? So that's the way, that, that is the destination that the Environment Agency is on with at the moment, working in partnership with uh, local authorities and other. And the reason I put buy water there is that we've already got uh, a living with water project in uh, East Yorkshire, and we've got a connected by water project in South Yorkshire, which is bringing together water company and local authorities to look at flooding and NFM issues. We really, really need one in NFM. That's my, uh, however long I work for the uh, Environment Agency, if I can get one, if I can get that sorted before I leave, 
uh, that would be great. So let's come back to that ambition. So this is a bit I'm worried about. So you can see, uh, you can see where we are in terms of, at the moment in terms of that blue bar. That red bar represents, if we didn't do any more uh, policy interventions than we've got at the moment, good ecological status will very likely go backwards, not forwards. Uh, so what I'm saying is uh, that uh, Ranul Jayawardena, who's our new Secretary of State for um, the Environment, he needs to uh, have this sitting on his desk. He's given us three priorities. One is around uh, clean and plentiful water. Tick, great, glad you're interested. Fantastic, got some work to do. The other one is around agriculture and food security. The last one is around growth and what DEFRA can do to promote growth. You're going to see this all this week, won't you, in terms of it's growth, growth, growth. That's going to save us. So one of the things that working at the environment agency you see from politicians is they have the, uh, the, the brilliant ability to hold two things in their mind at once. One is uh, that when they're, talking to when they're talking to business, environment agency is a red tape re regulator who ties people up uh, and stops, uh, and stops <coughs> uh, that it's going to save the country from, uh, from uh, you know, through, through growth. When they get constituent phone them up about something that's gone wrong, uh, we're a toothless regulator who aren't working hard enough and do you need more powers. And those two things uh, run, run in tandem for us uh, at all times. So what, what, what are we thinking about in terms of the future? So these are all the plans that we currently do in terms of our silo functional thinking. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's going to be a move to more holistic planning, one plan for water. Uh, I think we need to link in transport a bit better. 18% of the problems in river, rivers come from runoff from roads, but we don't routinely uh, ask for that as part of, uh, as part of new road development. Uh, water, efficient, water efficiency is going to be a massive issue. Uh, if, uh, if we don't get significant rain uh, over the next couple of months, next year is going to be very, very difficult for Yorkshire. I'll just, I'll just put that there. Brexit. What does Brexit do? Well, the whole reason that we made that whole complicated uh, thing around Water Framework Directive is because it was EU legislation. Well, it ain't EU legislation anymore. It's UK legislation. And if the UK uh, wants to unpick it or change it, uh, the government has the right to do that now, without consultation. Again, that's something to think about, I think. And then there's the thing about land use strategy. So all the stuff that you talk about in terms of the solutions, in terms of plant more trees or create more habitat, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to take something away. And I don't see a clear strategy at the moment for where those trees are going to be planted uh, or uh, and why is that important? Because in, in, in Yorkshire you've got thousands of landowners. And landowners, quite rightly, aren't going to want to change what their land does for them without some kind of incentive. And that's where the bit around local nature uh, recovery strategies and the environmental land management uh, funding comes in. Talk to my chum, uh, James Copeland from the NF, NFU. Uh, he would say, at the moment, his members are confused about what they should go for. And where you've got confusion, you're not going to get a really solid solution and a solid answer. But if water and land are totally connected, that, those things are going to have to work hand in hand. <coughs> okay, summary. Sorry, I'm going on one time. Yeah. Rivers are cleaner than, okay, cleaner than ever. Cleaner, cleaner than since the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution. 75% good ecological states, still miles away. Miles away. Needs massive investment. Uh, you guys, and me, we all expect more. Uh, gone are the days where we treat rivers as disposal systems. People want, if COVID has taught us anything, uh, being in nature and uh, having recreation in, in and around rivers is something that's really, really important to all of us. And I'm, and I'm really pleased that everybody here has, has turned up because I think you want that message as well. Climate change, okay, yeah. The solutions for getting sewage out of rivers, which historically were pouring concrete or making new sewage works, how is that going to work uh, when all organisations have got a commitment to pour less concrete and use less carbon, and yet we don't have a clear strategy at the moment for how those blue-green infrastructure is going to work. Uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a technical manual that you can go to to, uh, to, uh, uh, to do that for a, a sewage outfall. And yet Yorkshire Water have to set in train the investment for the next 10 years before March, and that, and that isn't available. So those are just some of the challenges that the Environment Agency have got, and, and all its partners. Uh, I will stop there. I could go on for hours now, so catch me at the break uh, if you want to talk about it.